In the Soviet Union and in America, the Cold War was fought by fear. The Soviet Union raised fences against the outside world. The Gulag, the secret universe of labor camps, swallowed the lives of millions. Both sides turned their fear inwards against their own people. They hunted the enemy within. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. The Cold War made America renew its values, invent new images for American virtue. Men and women in all walks of life, we are shareholders in the greatest enterprise on earth, the United States of America Unlimited. Our strength lies in the character of our people, young in heart, independent in thought and nature, skilled of hand. American enterprise has harnessed fire and water, wind, sun, and soil to produce an abundance of everything. Was communism out to destroy all this? American propaganda said it was. Stalin said, the whole world is aware that the Soviet Union demobilized its forces after the war. Beware the big lie. At home, Americans feared red subversion. Congress revived the House Committee on Un-American Activities. In 1947, the committee investigated Hollywood, factory of America's imagination. Have you ever observed any communistic information in any scripts? Well, I have turned down quite a few scripts because I thought they were tinged with communistic ideas. They uh, haven't attempted to use me, I don't think, because apparently um, they know that I'm not very sympathetic to communism. There has been a small group within the Screen Actors Guild which has consistently opposed the policy of the Guild Board and Officers or the Guild itself as evidenced by the vote on various issues. That uh, small clique uh, has been referred to, has been discussed as more or less following the tactics that we uh, associate with the Communist Party. If I had my way about it, they'd all be sent back to Russia or some other unpleasant place. Ten witnesses, the Hollywood Ten, defied the committee's right to ask about their beliefs. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It's unfortunate and tragic that I have to teach this committee the that's basic principles the of Americanism. Question, that's not the question. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I'm framing my answer in the only way in which any American citizen can frame his then answer you deny, to the question then you which invades his... Absolutely invade. Then you life. deny to you you refuse to answer that question. Is that correct? I have told you that I will offer right. my beliefs, my affiliations, and Excuse everything else Excuse to the witness. American public, and they will know where I stand, as they do from what I have written. Stand away I have from the stand. From, for Americanism for many years, and I shall stand away from the stand. Fight for the Bill of Rights, which I'll you are trying to destroy. Man away from the stand. 
Others from the film industry demonstrated their support for the constitutional rights of the Ten. Are you or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I believe I have the right to be confronted with any evidence which supports this question. I should like to see what you have. Oh, well, you would. Yes. Well, you will pretty soon. <laughs> the witness is excused. Either you completely cooperated with the committee, which meant saying yes or no to the question about whether you were a communist or ever had been, and um, if, if the answer was yes, as it was in my case, um, the ne we knew the next question was who else was, and we certainly didn't want to go into that. The ten were imprisoned. With hundreds more, they were blacklisted, their livelihoods taken away. People generally in Hollywood were pretty scared to have anything to do with us. Whereas before we went to prison, they had um, not been nearly as scared, and there were plenty of undercover arrangements that were made to uh, write scripts under pseudonyms for a good deal less money than you were accustomed to being paid. There were uh, a couple of possible suicides as a result of it. There were um, uh, a, a, a good deal of uh, misery. Americans feared that the enemy would take advantage of their freedoms, that agents of communism were undermining America. A Soviet spy ring unearthed in 1946 led investigators to Alger Hiss, who had been a wartime foreign policy advisor. He was accused of passing secrets to the Soviet Union by a former communist, Whitaker Chambers. Have you ever seen this individual who is standing? I have. Do you know him? I identify him. In 1935 was the last time that you saw him. According to my best recollection, not having checked the record. Now, would you remain standing a moment, Mr. Hiss? Do you know... Hiss firmly denied that he had betrayed his country. New evidence of communist activities in government circles is promised by the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Microfilm reportedly found in a pumpkin on a Maryland farm is examined by investigator Stripling and Congressman Nixon. Richard Nixon, an ambitious young Republican, was convinced that Hiss was lying. It is the intention of the Committee on Un-American Activities to pursue this investigation until we put the spotlight on those high officials in the State Department who were responsible for selling this country down the river. Hiss was jailed for perjury. Nixon's name was made. He turned his crusade against communism into a weapon for Republicans. It was what made him. It paved the way for, for his whole career afterwards. Anti-communism was a gut issue with Nixon. I mean, it was something he believed sincerely and deeply, but of course he was a politician too. And he was a Republican politician, and the soft on communism issue was hurting the Democrats. And of course he used it. He would have been a fool not to. In America, patriotic enthusiasm for the democratic way of life reveals itself in a monster loyalty parade in New York. Everyone from vets to youngsters reveals his inborn dislike of communism. Anti-communism became the language for a new, more defiant vision of America. Singer Paul Robeson was open about his communist sympathies. In Moscow, he was welcome. Oh, that barge, lift that bale. You show a little grit and you land in the jail. But I keep laughing instead of crying. I must keep fighting. Until I'm dying And all the man river He'll just keep a rolling along. In 1968, 
In America, people were less friendly. Veterans of the American Legion turned out to demonstrate in 1949 when Robeson was due to sing in a concert at Peekskill, New York. The police expected trouble. The slogans of the demonstrators, um, it went, uh, go back to Russia, you white niggers, for instance, over and over. Commies, niggers, Jews. You got in, but you're not going to get out alive. Hitler didn't finish the job. We will. The concert turned into a riot. What the demonstrator has done is have piles of rocks. What the state police did is make the cars go out and go 10 miles an hour through that gauntlet. So the road, I mean, cars were smashed, the windows were smashed, the, the road was actually slick with human blood. And interracial couple just driving through happened to arrive at that moment. And of course they pulled the car over, they yanked the two of them out, and they said, that's Robeson, Junior, we got him. And they were going to bash the black guy's head in. I was standing over with a baseball bat. And a veteran, a man in uniform, army uniform, said, wait a minute. That's not Robeson. I know the pictures. That's not Robeson. That's not him. <laughs> the guy said, well, blankety blank is with a white woman. Kill him anyway. And the soldier said, held the bat, said, no, no, that's not the American way. You don't lynch the wrong nigger and it saved his life. Race hatred and the politics of fear had begun to merge. At home, the nation was angry and insecure. Abroad, communism was gaining force. The atom bomb explodes again in the headlines of the world. President Truman announces an atomic explosion detected somewhere in Russia, three years ahead of the schedule expected by the West. America's nuclear monopoly was over. Then came China. Tragedy overtook China. Armed and equipped by Russia, red hordes brought ancient Cathay to its knees. At the end of 49, all China sags under the red yoke. Communist leader Mao Zedong took over. America's Chinese allies, the defeated Chiang Kai-shek regime, fled with their followers into exile. Americans have always had, most Americans, a special feeling, a special attachment, a special interest in China. So it seemed incredible to most Americans, uninformed Americans, that uh, this country which we had lavished so much care and affection on, who we thought was so friendly, so many of their people had studied in America and so on, should turn communist, turn over to the other side. Many people felt that there had to be some explanation. There had to be some sort of a conspiracy, some sort of a plot. Republican Senator Joe McCarthy blamed traitors in the State Department for the loss of China. He launched his own witch hunt. Today the most dangerous enemy agent is not so much concerned with the secret information about weapons as he is with infiltrating the necessary departments of the government and shaping and controlling the actions of our nation so that the enemy is progressively winning, winning without even firing a single shot. Now I intend to name names, John S. Service. And remember that name if you will. I have never knowingly transmitted any information which was, we say, secret military plan. Service was hounded out of the State Department. Uh, I had trouble renting homes or renting apartment in New York. And the companies, uh, well, what did our stockholders say, you know? So the companies that I had known and had dealings with abroad, export companies, around, they said, sorry, sorry, we think you're a fine guy, but we don't dare touch you. One communist. One communist on the faculty of one university is one communist too many.
One communist among the Admir American advisors at Yalta was one communist too many. And even, even if there were only one communist in the State Department, even if there were only one communist in the State Department, that would still be one communist too many. President Truman tried to dismiss McCarthy's attacks. Not a single person who has been adjudged to be a communist or otherwise disloyal or remains on the government payroll today. We're not going to turn the United States into a right-wing totalitarian country in order to deal with a left-wing totalitarian threat. But leaders of the American Communist Party were jailed and the persecution spread. Left-wing labor organizations were banned, radical groups indicted, demonstrations broken up. And if they put the word commie on someone, that meant that that person was an agent of the Soviets, that meant that that person was dangerous and had to be done away with. The FBI under Edgar Hoover uncovered several Soviet spy rings. They used the national interest to justify any method of locating subversives. We were using the same methods that uh, Hoover accused the Communist Party of using, and that's getting uh, people to spy on their friends. And this was one of the criticisms he had of the Communist Party. I felt guiltless. What had I ever done wrong? I'd never even gotten a traffic ticket. And here I was called before in public, a state senate investigating committee about my beliefs. I felt very, very wronged, and I felt that I had to not only uphold myself, my reputation, but that of my fellow teachers, my fellow union members, my fellow citizens. We would talk to children if they were in college, about their parents, and we talked to parents about children, and we talked to the neighbors about those people, and we, if someone did seem halfway sympathetic in the Communist Party, we talked to them. It was totally damaging to what we deeply believed America was supposed to stand for. In the 1952 presidential election, General Eisenhower, the Republican candidate, chose the red-baiting Richard Nixon as his running mate. Eisenhower mocked the Democrats for being soft on communism. The future of this country belongs to more courageous men. It belongs to men... It belongs to men who know that freedom's fight must be forever, relentless, uncompromising, and fair. It belongs to men who, today, are ready to bear spiritual, and intellectual arms against an alien army of communist ideas. To get elected, Ike needed the support of Joe McCarthy and his right-wing followers. I spent about half an hour with the general last night, but I can't, but I can't report that we agreed entirely on everything. <laughs> uh, 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 I can, I can report that when I left that meeting with the general, I had the same feeling as when I went in, and that is that he's a great American, will make a great president, an outstanding president. Right from the beginning, he detested uh, 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 Joe McCarthy. McCarthy was uh, the first-class demagogue and Eisenhower just couldn't stand that type of person. Eisenhower's old wartime commander, General Marshall, was accused by McCarthy of treachery. Intimidated, Ike dropped words praising Marshall from an election speech he made in McCarthy's home state. He was roundly uh, criticized uh, for, for that because it seemed to indicate that he was uh, influenced by McCarthy. 
1953, two Americans, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, were convicted of spying for the Soviet Union. They were sentenced to death. They had young children, and their fate roused protests in America and across the world. For some young lawyers, the sentence breached the Constitution. They sought judges to get a stay of execution. Judge Frank looked at us, and he says something that we have never, never forgotten. He said, if I were as young as you are, I would be sitting there saying the same things you're saying, arguing the same points you're arguing, making the same argument that these planned executions are invalid. But when you are as old as I am, you will understand why I cannot do it. And he stands up, turns his back to us, walks away, and we're devastated. We began to sense something which in later years we understood so clearly. And that was that Jerome Frank, as the leading liberal judge, was terrorized himself and frightened by the atmosphere of fear in the country. That if he, as a liberal, would do something to save Julius and Ethel Rosenberg's life, he would be charged as a commie. The Rosenbergs were executed. He died quickly. There didn't seem to be too much life left in him when he entered behind the rabbi. He seemed to be walking in a cadence of steps as, as if keeping in time with the muttering of the 23rd Psalm. She died a lot harder. When it appeared that she had received enough electricity to kill an ordinary person and, and had received the exact amount that had killed her husband, the doctors went over and pulled down the cheap prison dress, a little dark green printed job, and placed the stethoscopes, stetho, I can't say it, placed the stethoscopes uh, to her and then looked around, looked at each other rather dumbfounded and seemed surprised that she was not dead. And she was given more electricity, which started again that kind of a ghastly plume of smoke that rose from her head and went up against the skylight uh, overhead. After two more of those jolts, uh, Ethel Rosenberg uh, had met a maker. She'll have a lot of explaining to do, too. Thank you. McCarthy now denounced leading Republicans and even senior army officers as communist sympathizers. But he had gone too far. Political opinion swung away from him and his enemies gained courage. Give the names of communists. You said to the army. You've done enough. Have you no sense of decency, sir, at long last? Have you left no sense of decency? It all sort of it came to pieces. And then there was this move to censure him, and uh, he fought that very badly. Now, a number of us were advising him on how to handle that, and he agreed to everything we said, and then he did, did just the opposite. You have been here trying to smear the staff of this committee. The young men who have been working to uncover communists, you jump up and run away. McCarthy's power collapsed as the politicians walked away from him. But the spirit of McCarthyism, the smearing of dissent as communist treason, stained American democracy for decades. In the Soviet Union, all dissent was suppressed. The Cold War heightened tensions and reinforced fears, not just of internal subversion, but of another world war.
Obsessively, Stalin spoke of the danger to world peace, the need for vigilance against internal enemies. Conformity was enforced by police terror and by a slavish cult of Stalin's personality. He became godlike, his icon worshipped everywhere. For those who did not conform, there was silence and death behind the barbed wire. The Gulag, the secret empire of concentration camps, stretched over 4,000 miles from the Baltic to the Pacific. In the Cold War years, the camps continued to devour the lives of millions. Stalin's control now extended beyond the Soviet Union. This was a new empire, run by local communists, trained to obey Moscow. American propaganda targeted the fate of these satellite nations. The battleground of peace today is that strip of strategically located countries stretching from the Baltic to the Black Sea. They are not big countries geographically but they contain 70 million freedom-loving people, our kind of people, who share our culture and who have sent millions of their sons and daughters to become part of these United States. Some call these countries the satellite nations. More accurately, they are the captive nations of Europe. My name is Ronald Reagan. Last year, the contributions of 16 million Americans to the Crusade for Freedom made possible the World Freedom Bell, symbol of hope and freedom to the communist-dominated peoples of Eastern Europe. In Western Berlin, great crowds turned out to see it raised to the tower of the West Berlin City Hall. The campaign was secretly funded by the CIA. As well as fine words, Americans sent armed exiles back into the Soviet Empire. This was the effort of the CIA and uh, the young refugees were recruited. They were trained in haste in all kinds of subversion, sabotage, intelligence. They were given cameras, the short radio stations, codes, and were simply sent there. But the regime did penetrate it. All these training camps and the reception committee was waiting for these people. And arresting them. Zbierane, żądane przez wywiad amerykański, jak zdjęcia, dokonywane obiektów e, przemysłowych, mostów, stojów kolejowych. Niechaj tę prawdę. For the Polish authorities, these intrusions justified even harsher repression. The party called for vigilance against spies and saboteurs. In 1948, Stalin began to tighten the Soviet grip on Eastern Europe. In Yugoslavia, Marshal Tito had defied Stalin and broken away from the Soviet bloc. Moscow abused him as a traitor, a deserter to the camp of American imperialism. Stalin moved fast to prevent Tito's mutiny spreading to other satellite states like Czechoslovakia. At first, the satellites were allowed to find their own paths to communism. Now, Stalin forced the Soviet model on them all. Everyone must march, shout, obey. Adieu. 
revoluce sovětských národů a mírové fronty celého světa veliký Stalin. To subdue protest, Moscow ordered show trials of leading East European communists. In Czechoslovakia, Rudolf Slansky, party secretary, was among those chosen for sacrifice. Stalin needed to discipline his new camp, his new empire. And he disciplined it to such an extent that people living in those countries should not develop any idea of being able to do anything except what he orders them to do. And one of the methods of disciplining it was terror. Slansky was charged with Titoism, spying and sabotage. His confession was fiction, drafted by Soviet advisers. To tedy znamená, že na začátku své politické činnosti před orgány buržázní moci jste si vedli jako oportunista a zbabělec a ne jako komunista. Je to the initial investigation results were prepared and checked. If the evidence in these cases didn't meet the aims of the security services, then it was altered. Really, it was a fabrication to prove what otherwise couldn't be proved. Jaký to řetěz otřásajících zločin. Avšak přes rafinované spiklenectví a záškodnictví, přes rstivou obojetnost a hanebnost svých prostředků nedosáhli svých cíl. Byli rozdrceni. The, the key was the confession of the indicted person. And then there was no need of any proofs. As soon as the confession was obtained, that was enough for the trial and the sentence. So we were put at the disposal of the secret police with almost unlimited powers over us to bring us into a state where we were prepared to make that confession. It was torture. They were shouting and swearing at me. I had to look into their eyes. At the beginning, I avoided this, but then I had to repeat their obscenities. Then I started to make up fairy tales for my son. I got into an imaginary world of castles and princes and animals. So when they shouted at me, I didn't have to answer them. I only looked into their eyes while I was making up these fairy tales. No. <laughs> It's not easy. I don't feel sorry for myself. <laughs> Everything was rehearsed, the final text prepared for the trial, consisting of questions which were put to one by the uh, general attorney and the president of the court and so on, were listed and your answers were listed. Přišel jsem do dělnického hnutí jako člověk buržázního původu. Můj otec byl zámožným vesnickým obchodníkem. Vyrůstal jsem v prostředí obchodnické rodiny a to ovlivnilo mé osobní vlastnosti a můj charakter. Vstoupil jsem v roce 1921 do komunistické strany a přišel jsem tam s různými maloměšťáckými názory, kterých jsem se nezbavil. To vedlo k tomu, 
že jsem se nestal skutečným komunistou a že jsem jako komunista nejednal. Slansky and ten others were hanged in December 1952, their ashes scattered over the ice on an unknown country road. Stalin had shown his power. While he survived, it meant death to disobey him. In the Soviet Union itself, culture and science were kept insulated from the infection of all Western influence. The arts, painting, literature, music were regimented by the doctrine of socialist realism. Мне кажется Stalin's interference with the work of the Bolshoi theater was done with love and good taste. But the fear that it created and the fact that people were under his spell, this produced a lot of negative effects. It not only made people nervous, but destroyed the principles of art. Fear of Stalin's disapproval paralyzed the creative arts. Dmitry Shostakovich was reprimanded by the party for departing from the principles of socialist realism. Official art showed the Soviet Union as a promised land of plenty and of opportunity, guided by wise and selfless leaders. But those who discussed real change, even in private, like Susanna Pachuro and her student friends, risked punishment. We discussed a lot. And we came to the conclusion that what was happening then was completely different from what we were taught to believe. It wasn't socialism. Susanna joined a secret discussion group. Aged 17, she was arrested, charged with treason and terrorism. Three of her friends were executed. They said, get ready. You come with us. I went to get dressed behind the screen in the room, and I clearly realized then that I would not be coming back. At that moment, I could see myself in the prison cell. Later, when I really was in the prison cell, I kept thinking back to that moment. Over the years, millions shared Susanna's fate. They vanished, often without trace. Even to ask about them was to risk arrest. There are some things that are so awful, I don't let myself remember them. Because if I do, I can't sleep for weeks. They pulled children out of the arms of their screaming mothers and then beat the mothers. The children just disappeared. They never knew what happened to them afterwards. There was nothing more awful than that, even though I saw them killing people and anything else they felt like doing. In 1952, Stalin presided over the 19th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party. The hall was packed with foreign delegations gathered to honor him. Stalin was old now, 
but still the unchallenged leader of world communism. Cold War, military competition with America, was already putting a heavy load on Soviet society. In public, Stalin's analysis of the world class struggle was hopeful. But Stalin still feared the enemy within. He saw treachery everywhere. Above all, he suspected so-called cosmopolitans, mostly Jewish intellectuals and professionals who had already been persecuted for their Western contacts. Stalin needed an internal enemy, a fifth column that could be blamed for the difficult situation in the country. And the Jews fitted that role very well. Because many Jewish families in the post-war years had someone in the United States, relatives or acquaintances. So to present Jews as the fifth column, agents of American imperialism, was very convenient. In January 1953, nine Kremlin doctors were accused of plotting with Western intelligence to kill Soviet leaders. Я должен сказать, что, конечно, все это было спровоцировано. The doctor's plot was instigated with Stalin's approval. Stalin had been suspicious of doctors for a long time before that. This was all due to his illness, made worse by his old age and by his lifelong ideology that the enemies who always surround you should be constantly eliminated. One of the doctors, Yakov Ettinger, died under torture. His son was arrested and interrogated. They wanted me to make a confession, to make a statement that I was in the know, that I was familiar with certain facts which showed that my father and other doctors were wrongly treating certain patients. They wanted me to make this kind of statement, but they didn't get it from me even though twice I was sent to the punishment cell. Five of the nine doctors were Jewish. The affair inflamed Russian anti-Semitism. Jews were denounced and purged throughout the medical profession and beyond. Suddenly, one winter night, Stalin collapsed with a brain hemorrhage. No one dared to treat him as he lay half-conscious on the floor. Eventually, on the 5th of March, 1953, he died. Like the majority of people, we saw it as a tragic event. It caused a lot of anxiety. How were we going to live now? When the foundations of our lives were shattered. The image of Stalin created by propaganda was of someone who was irreplaceable.
Stalin had towered over the Soviet Union in peace and war for more than 20 years. Even those who hated him could not imagine a future without him.